we are heading off to Nigeria, where it's days before a presidential election and the country is struggling with severe cash shortages and civil unrest. So despite all of this, people are still not turning to the national digital currency, the e-Naira. The CBDC was launched in October of 2021 and has been pretty slow to gain adoption. People are saying that there's just not enough places to use it and merchants are not willing to set up the uh, infrastructure to accept it. Zach, I'm going to kick this one off to you. Seems like an infrastructure problem and maybe a little bit of an education problem. What do you make of this? The Naira has been around for some time now. Yeah, we'll call it the chicken and the egg or the electric car problem. Without some of the infrastructure to support these things, they're just not going to hit the road in meaningful ways. And I think that's something that you see with a lot of emerging technologies is like, okay, cool. Like, do I take the leap as an individual consumer and use this thing that I may not be able to like fully use either on the road or at a store that I that I tend to visit. And I think that is sort of like where, um, you know, adoption cycles are like really interesting to study, right? Like things that become desirable and or cool often sort of kickstart these uh, adoption cycles. And I think there is a lot of interesting research around that. You look at like the iPhone, right? I know we had this thing in the news where like the original iPhone just like sold at a crazy amount at an auction. So anyway, but in terms of sort of capturing desire in some of these new products, I think that's where... CBDCs are certainly going to face an uphill battle, right? Like, how do you make digital cash cool? Like, even when there is ostensibly a need for something like that, uh, even that need isn't great enough to induce people to actually use it, right? So I think there is going to be an interesting sort of marketing push around CBDCs, whether it's in Nigeria, China, or, you know, say it's say in the EU at some point in the, in the near future. The, the case for getting folks to use these things, I think, is going to be really interesting to see how various countries go about go about doing this, you know, whether it is that sort of Chinese approach, hey, you got to spend it or else it's going to go away. Or maybe there's some other sort of more uh, gentle incentives out there that'll get people using CBDCs as they uh, as they roll out. Jen. Yeah, I'm going to give a little bit of historical context before I pass it back to pass it over to Adam. So at the end of 2022, the outgoing president changed the currency design and there was a slow changeover that caused the ATMs to draw out. So that's why there's this cash issue in Nigeria. And Nigeria is a really cash heavy population. They they use cash a lot. It's in the tens of billions that is um, extracted from ATMs every year. And, and they use it for things like taking taxis, going to the markets. Uh, and so there's a severe shortage. People aren't able to access food and fuel. And despite this, they're still not turning uh, to that CBDC. Zach, did I see your hand go up? You did indeed. I wanted to sort of posit a troll take and then toss it to Adam, right? I mean, Nigeria was long heralded as one of these big, you know, Bitcoin adopting nations where there was some of that uptick on the local Bitcoins uh, and Paxfuls of the world. Those peer-to-peer trading marketplaces saw a lot of activity in Nigeria. And there is no mention of Bitcoin filling this void in this story, right? It's not even on the table. So the idea that a cryptocurrency could come in and solve some of these problems uh, that are stemming from the cash shortages, that doesn't seem to be in the equation at all. I just want to throw, I want to mention that and then throw it to Adam for his thoughts on whether or not, you know, Bitcoin fixes this in this instance, uh, doesn't seem to have much foothold. I mean, I think that until we finish this part of sort of the, the cycle that we are in and have been in for a long time, the opportunity for Bitcoin to actually provide some type of systemic peg doesn't really exist, right? Right now, so I mean, like you can think about money in terms of what's the worst money compared to what's the best money and what's the gradient between the two, right? So when you're looking at a uh, national currency like the like the Naira, you're looking at a currency that doesn't have a great history. You're looking at a currency that's run by a government that hasn't historically done a great job of actually managing this. And so you find an economy that is at least in part dollarized, which means that people are choosing to use money that is not issued by their government, but is still found to be valuable by other people who they want to trade with and doesn't have the liability of the government being able to do stuff with it, right? So you, or in terms of like change the rules on it. So you then draw back from that and you say, okay, so we're taking the government currency that already has these problems and now we're creating a, a version that has more surveillance characteristics and that has the ability for people, because again, uh, once, once you pull your money out into cash, you have the cash, right? You have the cash. Government doesn't know what you do with it. The government isn't watching what's going on with it. They can't do anything to the cash in your hand once you already have it unless they change the whole currency. Once you get into the central bank digital currency uh, side of the arena, it's not really true. And so that's kind of the big challenge around there. So right now on the kind of the best money that exists out there is the dollar and worse monies 
are these national currencies that don't have a great history. In the future, the expectation on my side remains that the dollar will increasingly be recognized as being just as problematic as these other currencies. It just has better fundamentals today because it still is the global reserve currency. So the question for Bitcoin is a lot less about can Bitcoin solve problems uh, today while we're still in this transition? Or does Bitcoin offer an alternative to something that is effectively the next iteration of the dollar issued by another country that will inevitably abuse the system and then blow up the money for the entire world as has happened over and over and over and over and over again throughout history? That's where Bitcoin comes in. Uh, it's definitely a speculative use case, but it's an important one. And it's one that, again, like when we see turmoil in currencies, especially in the dollar as we get closer to that, but you know, even just in kind of these other nations around the world, that's the instinct that you're seeing. That's the urge. It's that our money sucks. We have no choice but to use this. We would like something better. And there will come a time when there will be a choice. It'll be interesting. Uh, Jen. Yeah, and I think another roadblocker for crypto that was mentioned in the article especially for Nigeria, is internet access and smartphone access, right? So to use the eNaira, you need to have a smartphone, you need to have internet access. And there were some numbers mentioned in the article that I think it said between 25 and 45 million people in Nigeria have a smartphone, but the population is a population of 219 million. And now if we compare that to... Now, I don't know what, how many uh, people are unbanked in Nigeria or what percentage of the population, but if we compare that to people who have bank accounts in a lot of African countries, you know, you can send micropayments to people using a regular feature phone and an SMS. And so I think this like infrastructure thing is something that we're going to have to um, see evolve if we want crypto to be adopted in places like this.